Hello, everyone. We are live and recording. My name is Kelly Ann. I'm a Serious Galaxy bookseller. And tonight I have the pleasure of introducing our lovely author, Karen Cushman. Tonight, we're here to celebrate her newest book, which came out today. It's War and Millie McGonagall, which is described as a story of sunshine, siblings, and stress, set in California during World War II. Karen is a Newbery Award-winning author of Catherine Called Birdie and several other popular books for middle grade readers. And tonight we are also joined by our guest conversation partner, Colby Sharp. Um, before I pass it off to our moderator, Colby, I'm just gonna do a quick little introduction to Crowdcast for anyone in the audience who hasn't attended one of our virtual events before. As I'm sure you guys already know, I see like so many warm welcomes there. There's the chat section on the right hand side. You guys are welcome to write whatever messages you have for our author tonight there. Um, and if you have a question that you'd like to ask, you're going to want to go ahead and click the ask a question button at the bottom below the video. That'll pull up a pop up window. You can type your questions in there and then Colby will get to them in the second half of the event. And right below our video too, really importantly, you'll see a green book that says buy books with signed personalized book plates. That'll do exactly that. You can, it'll take you straight to the Mysterious Galaxy website where you can purchase Karen's book. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off. You guys have a great event tonight. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Colby Sharp. I am a fifth grade teacher in Michigan, and I am honored to be talking this evening with Karen Cushman, who wrote this beautiful book that I just read on spring break, War and Millie McGonagall. Did I say that yes. right, Karen? Yes, you yes. did. Uh, so I have a lot to talk to you about, but I want to actually start with a... Uh, I want you to tell the story that you probably told a million times. You actually wrote a, I am one of the co-founders of the Nerdy Book Club and Karen wrote a post for us. I think it was like eight years ago. She wrote the post. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. She wrote the post way back many years ago and it was about her two Newberry calls. So if you did not know, yeah. Karen Cushman won a Newberry honor and then the very next year won the John Newberry medal. And this story of you and your husband is just, I think the perfect way to start this out as this okay. book was kind of set with, uh, from his childhood and him growing up. So if you could tell us that Newberry story, uh, I just want right. to hear it from you. After I wrote Catherine Called Birdie, um, I knew there was such a thing as a, as a Newberry Award. And I knew that it was given out at a library conference sometime in the winter. <laughs> That's just about all I knew. Mm -hmm. But I had to, you know, this was my first book, and I was sure that nothing was going to happen. I didn't need to be prepared, you know. I just started. And uh, <laughs> my husband was sure that it was going to win something. I said, no, I'm brand new. They won't give it to me. So we were in uh, Berkeley at that time, Berkeley, Oakland, and uh, the award was given. It was announced in Pittsburgh or someplace on the East Coast. And they like to talk to the winner before they announce it to the public. So it was 8 o'clock on the East Coast, and our phone rang. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. So Phil picked up the phone, <laughs> and uh, I heard wah, 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 on the other side. And he said, do you know what time it is? <laughs> and uh, wah, 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 and I said, well, who is it? What is, he said, it's some librarian called. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, you better give me the phone. So he gave me the phone, and it was indeed a librarian announcing that Catherine Call Birdie had been named a Newbery Honor Book. Well, I was pretty blown away. Mm -hmm. Phil was humiliated. He felt so badly that he handled that call that way, and he was determined. He was sure of two things. One, that in my next book, the Midwife's Apprentice was going to win um, the entire medal, and he was going to handle it much better. So the next year, we figured out when the, the call would be made, what date, and we got all ready. He had the phone, the cell phone. I guess it wasn't a cell phone at that time. It was a cordless phone next to his side of the bed. And he practiced sitting up, hello. 
hello, <laughs> so that he would do it, you know, very um, just right, and he, he wouldn't be embarrassed. He'd make up for the last year. So the phone actually rang at 5, 5.30 again. I don't remember where they were calling from, but it was a lot earlier on our coast. And so he reached out to get the phone, and he knocked it on the floor, and it bounced under the bed. So I'm yelling, get the phone, get the phone, <laughs> as if they would say, oh, she's not answering, so we'll give it to somebody else. The next person on the list, yeah. That's right, that's right, <laughs> the heck with her. Um, so he climbed under the bed, and pretty soon an arm came out with the phone in it from underneath the bed. And it was, once again, somebody, a, a librarian, announcing that I had won the Newberry Medal. Well, he went in the kitchen, and um, behind a bunch of old lettuce and stuff was a bottle of champagne chili. That's how sure he was that it was going to win. So I think that's the first and last time we had champagne at 5.30 in the morning, but you know it was a great occasion so we enjoyed it i i just think that's amazing like the support that he has for you and the confidence oh, that he has I in your wife no i know that how much support I, just, I get from him yeah i just can't i guess that i'm guessing that that helps tremendously to have someone oh, yeah. so close to you in your corner absolutely that's that's amazing and and in your new book um here in the back it says that Parts of this book are based on your husband's experiences growing up yeah. on the beach in San Diego. So I think that's a nice segue. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the new book? Okay. The new book, um, Warren Millie McGonigal, is about a 12-year-old girl who wants to... Um, uh, oh, gee, what was I going to say? I forget what I was going to say. She has tides to watch and dead things to find on the beach. Mm because her grandmother gave her a, a book and said, take, um, make a list of all of the things that may be lost or dead, and that way you can remember them all your life. So she misunderstands, and she makes it into the book of dead things. And that suits her because she is afraid, she is worried, she's unhappy at home, she... Uh, wants it to rain more. So she has a lot of things to complain about and um, some with good reason, like the co the coming war. So she gets really involved with uh, the listing of dead things and finds um, dead octopuses and uh, shrimp on the beach and draws their pictures. And she also makes a list of people she knows who are dead, somebody's uncle and somebody, Carol um, Lombard, the actress, and. Um, soldiers whose names she hears and she puts them in the book and how she and her my husband was just there with a piece that said and her grandma dies yes and her grandma dies so at the beginning you kill the grandma at the beginning karen mm, right you know oh. i had to start right in the middle there. Oh. yes so she has to learn how to cope with yeah. all of that and with um, her, her growing up and with the world changing and what she has to do um, to not only survive, but to thrive, which I hope she does. Yeah. And uh, she, the, the family is struggling. They, mm -hmm. the, the, the father is out of work. Right. And the the mother is trying to to kind of figure things out and keep the family afloat, and and they live. I just kept thinking, like, man, they could never live in that house today, like where they lived. Like, how much it would probably it would cost be in San Diego? Of millions of dollars. That's right. <laughs> yeah, That's still there. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Phil actually grew up there in the fifties. I think they moved away early sixties, uh, so he saw big changes. But when he was young. Um, Mission Bay was more like a, a small fishing village than the big resort that it is now. And um, they had, it was a tidal plain, and every day the tides would come in and out. And when they came in, uh, there was uh, enough water for them to go. He would go fishing and for perch and for small halibut and um, watch uh, seals frolicking in the water. And when the tide went out again, it uncovered the mud flats, this very pungent uh, place where uh, there were pockets of eelgrass and um, pickleweed and a lot of little crustaceans and insects that shorebirds would come and eat. So it was a very lively place. And he found a lot of uh, comfort and support from the beauty and the, and the peace of that uh, area. And 
as he would tell me these stories, I would think, you know, this sounds idyllic. And at one point I said, I would like to put a character there, someone who needed that kind of peace and that kind of comfort and support. And that's how Millie was born. I put so, her there. You can yeah. find her there. Okay. Yes, you can. So, and if you click that little green button at the bottom of your screen, you can get a personalized <laughs> copy of this book, which I think we all would love to add to our collection. So you're no stranger to writing beautiful historical fiction, middle grade novels. If you could talk a little bit um, mm -hmm. about two things. One, the what the rest of the research looked like besides talking with your husband. Mm -hmm. And also how has your research project changed in any way over the last 25 years since okay. um, you started, because the world is a lot different now. That's so right. what is your right. process for this book and maybe how is that different than how, and, and the same than you used to research? Well, uh, the first thing that I did was find this map online. So there's a big difference between 25 years ago and now is the internet. I found a book on uh, a map online from 1940 that showed the, the um, San Diego area, and you could see Mission Beach, which was this skinny little spit of land with one side on the uh, bay and two blocks over this other edge was on the ocean. And I thought, you know, it really brought it home to me how I, not isolated, but remote that was and how small a world it was. The uh, whole spit was only two blocks wide and... Mm miles long. So that was the first thing that I found. Um, I was able to use um, the library to look at copies of um, newspapers like the San Diego Union Tribune and at the LA Times and I pulled those up online also. Okay. I used a lot of books. I needed to know not just dry facts but I needed to know about attitudes and values mm -hmm. and what people thought was important and what they didn't, what they believed. So I used a, a lot of books about, uh, about that. The San Diego Historical Society has a wonderful magazine and uh, they had a special issue called War Comes to San Diego with different articles and things and that was a really big help. I also was able to go to San Diego and though the Mission Beach is a lot different, we were walked on it and um, smelled the, the uh, not the mud flats, they're gone, but we smelled the ocean and listened to the birds, the gulls squawking and um, watch the sunlight play on the little waves on the bay. That helped a lot. Then uh, I had gone, oh, I found a picture of La Jolla Cove, where she goes to fish for abalone. And I had seen it when we lived in San Diego. We had seen it. But this photograph, photograph from the, I think it was late 40s, um, showed me the, the, lay, the layout, the geographical layout of the area. So those were a lot of the things that I used. Oh, and pictures. Phil's brother, Ed, uh, sent pictures of... Um, them in the late 40s and early 50s of his family and playing on the beach and Phil waving from the stoop Aww. of his house. So I was able to, you know, really um, get inspired by looking at them and thinking about what life would have been like there a long time ago, 80 years ago, mm. almost. Uh, and the, the internet is that magic word. That's what's really different. Uh, I didn't have, I couldn't go say, any place once the, um, the once COVID and the lockdown started. So I couldn't go to go yeah. check facts or anything mm -hmm. like that. I had to do it all online. With a new book that I'm working on, everything has to be online, which is even harder. Yeah. But I, I would say the internet has amazing things that you can find. When I was writing the book about alchemy and Maggie Swan, I found recreations online of alchemical libra uh, laboratories, all kinds of um, uh, implements uh, for um, uh, for uh, this book, for Mill Millie McGonagall. There were lists of uh, slang words in the 40s. There were, I could find out products what products did they have? I found out that cheery, Cheerios existed, but they were called Cheerios. And uh, which, uh, what kind brands of coffee? 
What radio programs did people listen to? All of these things, some of which made it in the book and some of which were just kind of a place for me to stand that I felt mm. more secure in this world by knowing a lot of these things. Polio, I did a lot of research about polio uh, because the characters know someone who had, gets polio, which was a, uh, a big, it wasn't as big a, a tragedy, uh, tragedy, it wasn't as widespread as the COVID, but it was the same mm -hmm. kind of thing that people were really afraid and scared yeah. and stayed home and the kids couldn't go to swimming pools and things. So I had to learn a lot about that. So, that line that you said that it you, it all didn't make it in, but it gave you a place to stand. That yeah. is so interesting to me. Like because what we know from experiencing this through the book, mm -hmm. you had to know so much more about that time period in that era, because obviously it's not going into it. But when when we started talking about research, like you lit up, like yeah. you are, you <laughs> like my, that. That's my favorite part. You know, I can do it sitting alone in in my room at home. Yeah. And uh, making things up and finding out things to, to enrich what I'm writing. Yeah. So what does that look like? Do you do like a tremendous amount of research and then start writing? Do you start writing and then go like, what is the, where well, does have, that fit in? I have the idea at first. Uh, okay. You know, like I, I use the um, simile as like, like Legos, that ideas come like Legos. Uh, one I, one uh, Lego is maybe a memory or a song or um, a person. And, but you get a lot of Legos and put them together and you can build a castle or you can build a story. So that, that those kinds of things come first, all of those little Legos. And often I start then with the first line and the last line. I don't know why, but that gives me edges, gives me boundaries, and it tells me what the journey is going to be from here to there. So then I sit down and figure out, start to write. And as I write, I find things that I need to know. I have to find out. <laughs> Start with an octopus. So I had to find more about an octopus. And um, uh, Phil actually saw the um, Portuguese fisherman catching the octopuses and biting them between the eyes. So he was good research. But also I did a lot more um, research about the Portuguese fishing industry in San Diego and lots of things. So that I, I would know that and I would know what was happening. Mm. And then it goes on like that. As I write, I find more things that I need to know. Or after I've written this part, I find something that is so important and evocative of the time and the story that I have to go back and put it in someplace. So it's not just um, linear. It jumps around back and forth. Yeah, but I researched the whole time on and off. Yeah. And when you say you sometimes start with like the first line, I want to read the first line. It's so much fun. Okay. George lifted George lifted the slimy creature to his mouth and bit it right between the eyes. <laughs> if that doesn't make the the ten year old <laughs> want to read more, I don't. I don't know what will. Uh, so. It seems like this process could you could just always keep working. Like, how do you know when it's done? Because like oh, you can always go back and learn. Like, how do you know right. when it's you really no longer you done? What yeah. I find is that when it comes to the place where I work for two hours and I find I have to put in a comma instead of a period, <laughs> and that was all, then I know well it's got to go to the editor, and the editor uh, always find something, you know, things that I need to improve or start over again or do, do big kinds of revisions at the beginning. And then as we go back and forth, there are little tiny things. And when they get too small, then it's done. Then it's done. It's done. You and do you finish one book completely before you start another book? Well, I pretty close to it. Like I started this other one that I'm working on maybe in that last October, okay. November, something like that. But um, I still have to put to uh, interact with the, the book that's at the editor back and forth and mm -hmm. then copy editing, you know, where you oh, swear yeah. at the copy editor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that goes on while I'm in the beginning stages of another book. Yeah. And so 
Uh, for those of you tuning in, thank you so much for being here. Karen and I are going to talk for 10 or 15 more minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So you'll see that little question box there. If you want to click on that and, and put something in there, we'll be sure to try to get to as many of those as we can uh, a little bit after 6. I think it's 6.30 your time. It's 9.30. My, it's 9.20 my time, Karen. I am taught all day <laughs> ready for bed <laughs> it's a I'll tell you teaching during COVID-19 with a mask mm -hmm. on all day it's pretty wild but we survived each day so far uh, I'm fascinated by the chapter titles and so you chap mm -hmm. that the chapter titles are the date and the day mm -hmm. of the week and I felt like it was just like a time bomb like we were like approaching Pearl Harbor like as mm -hmm. the reader yeah 30 so tell me about the decision to do that that's just fascinating to me. Well, it was really focused on, at first they were all Sundays, but then that got to confining, uh, working up to the Sunday of Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor. So then their other days showed up. But I had to know, because of the newspapers and because of real events and facts, I had to know what was actually happening what day. And if I said a, uh, a, um, a plane just crashed into San Diego Bay, I had to ha have it the, the right day. So I needed to have that structure oh, wow. for myself as well as for the readers leading them um, up to Pearl Harbor. Uh, so I, in my fifth grade classroom, uh, we actually began a reading unit today where we are studying historical fiction. Mm. Uh, so what would your, like if I were to say why, if my kids said this, they don't, but if they were to say, why should we read historical fiction? Why, like why? Like what's the, why do I need another World War II book? Like why should kids and adults, but why should we continue? Why do, and why should we, but also why do we continue to love this genre? So why should we read it? And what is it about it that makes it so special that we just can't get enough of it? Well, I think, Historical fiction, like all history, helps today's children, today's young people see beyond the boundaries of their own experience and see other people in other times and how they handled the same sorts of problems or similar kinds of problems, how um, the uh, people in the past didn't just wear funny clothes and talk funny, you know, that they were very much in a lot of ways, very much like us. And they had emotions and fears and how they handled their lives, I think, um, uh, helps us understand the past a little bit better and understand ourselves. And why is it so popular? I think they're wonderful stories, you know, and there's, what, 2,000, 3,000 years of stories out there and people and, and um, there's always something rich to read or to find out more about. And those are the stories I like to read. So I think that's a, one good reason that I like to write them because yeah. I, I enjoy them. Yeah. I was actually talking to my dad today in preparation for this. And I asked him this question. So I'm gonna ask you this question. So mm -hmm. what is it that, why, what is it about World War II that is so, do you think is so fascinating to readers? Because I feel like it is the single most popular timeline mm -hmm. or like event time mm -hmm. in history for children. Uh, the only like event that I can think of ha that has captured their interest for my entire teaching career is the Titanic. But mm, what is really? it, but what is, yeah, but what is it, what do you think it is about World War II that might well, be different from other things in history. Uh, partly, I think it's because it came close. We, the Civil War, we haven't had a, a, a war on this um, on this land, and especially uh, those of us on the West Coast, it came pretty close. You know, apparently, if the Japanese had not pulled back after Pearl Harbor, they might have invite, invaded the whole West Coast. So I think that for their parents and grandparents, it's sort of still a new experience and those feelings and emotions are pretty new. Um, I think it's very dramatic. I think right now, especially, it's very popular that, you know, how things go in trends. I mean, for adult fiction, there's tons of books about World War II. But also, I think it, it was representative of a different kind of culture or society that we don't have now. Um, the young people 
during World War II were actually able to help. They were plane mm. spotters. They collected uh, scrap metal. They um, uh, could only eat certain things because they were rationed. They had couldn't have, but gave up their bicycle tires for you know to, for the war effort. And I think everybody pulled together a lot more. I was thinking about that with COVID. Um, mm. Uh, wrote something for Powell's books in uh, Portland. And I, I felt sorry for today's young people that they didn't have that kind of thing, that, that they don't feel important or like they can fight against COVID. What can they do? They can't collect rubber and, you know, cans and donate them anywhere. So that may be another reason that's popular, that the time was more secure and people could kids could hang out and fill stories or they were out mm -hmm. in the morning and came back at night and and that's about it and nobody was they wasn't dangerous and all of those things might make it um a sort of interesting soothing and comforting to young kids today yeah that's interesting donating tires to your butt from your bike spotting planes yeah. that that's yeah. a lot more interesting sounding than staying away from other people and wearing right. a mask. It's, it's, it's not as fun. I mean, this is not yet. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and one thing that I love so much about this time period in reading stories is there's just so much, there's so many different stories. Like I feel like every time I get a chance to travel back to this time period, uh, I think a recent situ time was when I read Kimberly Brubaker Bradley's The yeah. War That Saved My Life. And yeah. I was, yeah. I was, I was there and I was, and yeah. now, and now I'm in a different country, okay. back to my country on the West Coast. There's just mm -hmm. so many yeah. possibilities. And I guess like the war affected everyone. Mm -hmm. And it right. was so interesting um, to get a chance to meet all of these these different characters. And can you talk, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the other characters that in Millie's family and the new friends she meets? Because I, th I think that that's one of the things about this book that readers are going to really uh, fall in love with is getting to meet, getting to meet these kids. Well, my favorite was Pete. Yeah, Pete's so, fun. Pete is a lot of fun. At five years old, he reminds me in many ways of my beloved brother, younger brother. Hi, Duffy. Um, uh, so that was a lot of fun. But he was lively, and I think he helped. Uh, what's it, Millie? I think he helped Millie a lot, not be so dour and gloomy all the time that she had to. Uh, interact with him and she had to um lighten up a little and he would amuse her and do funny things and she loved pete uh there's also a sister who is seven years old mm -hmm. I think, um who's sickly and that and she came along when millie was perfectly happy just being an only child with her parents and then all of a sudden there came um, a, another child and who was sickly and Millie felt like she got all her mother's attention mm -hmm. and um, was the favorite child because she was the neediest child. And she's a little bratty and a little um, feeling a little superior because she gets a lot of special things because she's sickly. And how Millie comes to terms with her and that um, is a big part of the story. There's also cousin Edna. Now, when I started, <laughs> when I started the book at the beginning, cousin Edna was just sort of a device for um, to for somebody to move in and move Millie even further out of her place in the family, so that Millie was predisposed to, to hate her and not like her. And as I got involved with Edna, I wanted her to be more than just a token. I wanted her to be a human being. I didn't start out to make her anything like an aunt of mine, um, but she was like that. Um, Edna is not um, mentally retarded or um, on the spectrum. She's just a little odd and a little removed and um, does better with somebody to take care of her. And my aunt was like that, and she became a nun at 16 the best thing that she ever did because she was taken care of for a long time and she taught kindergarten which was great with her. you know so she was taken care of and i wanted somebody to take care of edna like that also yeah and then there's rosie who 
is slightly older and slightly um, more sophisticated and more mature. And Millie can learn things from her uh, beyond what a 12 year old, you know, just learns that, that there is hope and there are fun things on the other side of 13 and 14 and 15. So it was really fun to uh, research jitterbugging, for example. Millie uh, learns to jitterbug from Rosie. And that was really fun to online and figure out how to describe it and the different songs that, that would play that they would jitterbug to. How do you show that, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a book? Bum, 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 that kind of stuff. So that was a lot of fun. Is that a, something that, that you uh, had to practice yourself? Did you do some jitterbug? Actually, I didn't. Oh, well, I didn't practice, you know, it's a little different when you, <laughs> when you have bad knees and a bad back. Yeah. Uh, it's probably not the best thing to do is to no. jitterbug, but mm. I, I know it from movies. There Jitter, you go. Judy Garland and, and, and uh, Mickey Rooney jitterbugged a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the some of the relationships that I found the most fascinating were the mother and Millie and and Lily and just what they learned, what Millie learned about how her mother and sister felt about her. Yes. And I think that's so interesting. Like, I think as kids and even as adults, we just assume that people feel the same way and we can hold on to, to certain things that mm -hmm. kind of skew our judgment. And I think that that's going to be a really powerful thing for, for kids to read. Uh, but so thinking about you writing about a family, it's obvious from the last names in the chat and you saying hi to a lot of family members. Family <laughs> seems like it's a really important and thing to you. Like you seem really close to your family. Uh, I am. We have a small family. I'm really close to my family. My parents are, are dead, but we were always very close and I'm extremely close to my brother. It's very easy to be That's close awesome. to and friendly him to him. Um, but I thought it was interesting because it's really the only book that's about a family. A, a, a lot of them have to are orphans or uh, some a child once asked said, did you hate your parents? And I said, no, I loved my parents. Why do you ask? And she says, because in your books, they're all mean or dead. And I said, well, you're right. They are. But uh, having a, a child, an orphan or a child on her own, uh, gives much more um, space for a child oh, learning okay. to take care of herself and what and for us to think what would it I be like if I were on my own if I were an orphan if I were out there without support so a lot of them are like that midwife's apprentice is like mm -hmm. that and Matilda Bone is like that and the parents were so important in this book though in this book like, yeah so Especially important her mother. yeah yeah, yeah. That was, yeah. Uh, what advice do you have? So this is a selfish question for the fifth grade teacher. Mm -hmm. So I love to teach writing and I love to help my kids write. Like how does, how do, what are you, tips do you have for kids or for teachers to help kids, not even necessarily like, like I'm not looking for like specific craft things. I just want them to love it because I feel like if they love it, then they will get better at it. Maybe and I just need, it, yeah. so like what tips do you have for yeah, young writers or, or what led you, what led you to becoming a writer? Like what is it about writing that helped you to follow? Oh, I wrote a whole lot as a child. Um, I wrote everything. I was always with a pencil and a paper. Um, but when I grew up, I, I didn't write anymore. So it didn't take. For some, for a lot of young write, of a lot of writers, it, it they kept going. I stopped for 25, 30, 40 years, 50. That's right, because I didn't start again till I was 50, and um, and I only started because my husband said when I wanted to tell him a story, he said I refuse to listen. He's been saying that for 25 years, but I will. <laughs> but I'll read it if you'll write it down. <laughs> that was the beginning of Catherine Galberti. Yes. See, I do depend on him a lot. What? Yes. So tips that I give young people, it's very hard. Um, they yeah. don't like it. I say, read a lot, write a lot. Don't expect to sit down and write a novel. You know, take it piece by piece. Um, a basketball player um, doesn't 
start out by buying a ball and then charging, um, challenging the Lakers to a game. You know, he starts out like most young men do, throwing the basket against the, uh, throwing the ball into the basket against the garage door a million mm. times over and over again. And that, that, it, it's like you need to exercise your writing muscles. But it's hard I, uh, to, to pay some young people um, like writing prompts. You can give them a writing prompt. Imagine Get that. Started. Or, yeah, that gets them started and then they can um, get really involved in it. Um, I just read the other day uh, uh, a piece from a Mary Oliver poem. I hope I can remember it. She said, um, instructions for living a life. And I think this applies to writing also. She said, uh, look around, be astonished, tell us about it. Mm. Look and around, be astonished, tell us pay, about it. Maybe it was pay attention, mm -hmm. in my mind. Pay attention, uh, be astonished, and tell us about it. And mm. That's what you, what young people can do. You know, they don't have to produce a product. And I think no. that stops yeah. a whole lot of them. And they think, I've got to Absolutely. write this. And, and somebody is telling me what I have to write. Yeah, that's you know. choice is so important. I think what I'll do, Karen, because, you know, I teach fifth graders and they have all kinds of things and they're telling me all day. They're just telling me stories, 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 stories. I'm just going right. to say, I'm not going to listen to it. You just, I'll read it. I'm not right. going to listen to there any stories. Go. Anymore. Karen Cushman gave me permission. There you go. You want a story. You want to tell me about your new dog? You want to tell me mm -hmm. about... Yeah. Write it down. So Write we'll see down. how that goes. Maybe that'll it work. For Maybe. Me. <laughs> or for you. I mean, you're doing pretty well. So I want to bring up some of these questions. And if, you have, if you're attending yeah, this and you I have... I want to say one thing before we do that. Oh, There's yeah. one thing I want to say. Lena Dunham of um, Girls, Girls, Fame, Girls Fame is in... England right now um, filming a movie of Catherine Colberti. What? Yes, they have finished the interiors in London and are on their way to Shropshire to Stokesy, Ca Stokesy Castle to film more uh, of the movie. Um, and that's, I was, we were supposed to go, Phil and I were supposed to go. I was gonna they ask. were going to send us to England to watch the filming, and that was last May. So everything had to be put off, and now we can't go. It's a closed set. <sighs> but I'm so excited to to see what she does with it. So when is the timetable? What's the who's producing? I don't know. They're just filming it? now. Um, okay. Uh, they are going. It's going to be on Amazon. Oh, oh yeah, I have that. Yeah. that's yeah. Okay. It was going to be a movie, but you know things changed in the last yeah. year and a half. Yeah, I don't so know. It'll be a movie yeah. on Amazon. That's exciting. Um, let's see. A, a young woman named Bella Ramsey, who was in Game of Thrones, is is um, Bertie, and Andrew Scott, who God, I remember him from the, the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock. He was uh, Moriarty, and he was the only Moriarty that I've ever liked. <laughs> better than Sherlock <laughs> Holmes. Yeah, so it's going to be, that's, he's Bertie's father. So that will be quite exciting. Now, are you, and like, are you, mm -hmm. do you like movie adaptations of books? Like as a viewer, do you get, are you nervous at all? Are you just completely excited? No, you know, I'm it's not, different. Like, I read how a are you feeling? from Ann Tyler who said, okay. sell a movie, a, a book, it's their movie. It's not okay. my book anymore. It's their movie. And if I am too trepidatious about it, I won't see it, you know. But I'm really curious to see what yeah. she does with it because she's an unlikely person to make the movie, if you ask me. But she said she fell in love with the book when she was 13. And she said, no way. That's amazing. She said, someday I want to make a movie of this book. Yeah, so it's been that long. How about that? That's so, so cool. Yeah. So I hope everybody gets to see it when that happens. Well, and also, in, in, in addition to that, that will bring even, uh, a whole generation of new readers to the book. Right. Right. Which is, and then, of course, they can come by this one, right? They can read this one after they read that one. So uh, that's okay, so exciting. So we can answer questions. No, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I, I will look forward to, to watching that. In my, with my own family. That's that's Good. so exciting. All right. So the first question we have, this comes from Jason. 
Is there any particular historical setting that would be off limits for you? Perhaps due to a lack of interest or difficulty relating to the time period or setting? Wow, that's a great question. Yes. Um, a child, a young person once asked me, why don't I write a Mayan book, a book about the Mayans? And I said, I can't, I can't do that. I could not get into the minds at all. It's not like I understand people in other time periods, but I think that that one would really be beyond me. I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't do that. I also wouldn't write a book that doesn't end on a hopeful note. Mm. I, you know, there's enough to be depressed about in the world without. Um, Isn't that the truth? People. Yeah. So those are two things. That's fantastic. Fantastic. So any other questions you guys have or gals have, please, please put them in the chat. These are so fun to see. Uh, next up, this is from Holly. Have you ever had writer's block or have you completely wrote off a book because it just wasn't working out? Well, writer's block, I think, happens to me when I'm not ready to move on. And the best thing for me to do is to put it in the drawer and go for a walk and watch the deer eat all our plants in the yard and um, uh, read a book, do something else, and then go back fresh. It also helps sometimes when I go to the beginning and start again, rereading it, because then I get back into the story and I can see what's holding me up. Um, so that's... I don't have terrible writer's block. That's what ha does happen. Um, I do have a couple of stories that I started. I started three of them at the same time, and it was Millie's that grabbed me. Okay. So were in, in drawers, maybe 20 pages, 40 pages each one, with the first line and the last line. <laughs> but I don't know if I'll ever go back. Uh, we'll see. Okay. I hear that a lot, that they're in a drawer. Are they actually, do you actually have a drawer? Or are they just like a file on your computer? No, I have these wonderful red filing boxes from, I, I don't remember. They might be from Amazon, I don't know. They're about this tall, you know, and they're the size of a piece of paper. And they each have these books uh, that are not, our only pages are, each one has its own little box. So all of your all of your books have one of these. Oh, not anymore. Just no, the ones so once that they're I'm done, reading, just the one writing anymore. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then what do you do with it afterwards? Like, what do you do with all the drafts and pages and? Well, now a, a lot of it is eaten up on mm -hmm. online. Uh, for yeah. the first books, I had just had huge cartons of of drafts over and over and over again. Um, but not anymore. There, things aren't preserved if you're uh, editing on online. And then I put in the jump drive to save it, and it says, "Should this be replaced?" And I say, "Yes." Oh um, no! There it goes. Yeah. But um, uh, those big boxes all went to um, the University of Minnesota the Curlin collection. Yes. I have a collection. I was going to ask. Cause that's uh, children's awesome. uh, authors, papers, and things. Um, so we can go and look at them. Yeah, like I could go because I, 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 mm -hmm. I know like all KD Miller's books are there, and a lot of authors have yeah. their work there. A lot of things, and they are used. Uh, uh, a professor from a, a literature and literacy class at University of Texas in Austin, um, and a couple of other people wrote this paper and worked with students about following um, revisions, they had to go through, I know I didn't sort them, I just threw like this, and they had to go through these boxes, looking and trying to find what was the next version after this, and the next version, and what did the editorial letter say, and how did I respond to that? So she said, that's what we do. That's what we, I felt so badly. There were grocery lists in it and all kinds of things. That's amazing. <laughs> That's so, I love that that stuff is, is preserved there. Yeah, that's the wonderful. People, yeah. When the end of the world comes, nothing will be around but um, Twinkies and the page, papers in the Curland Library because it's way down 10 floors or something. And you can see the side of the Mississippi River, the limestone 
Let's see, way down there. Yeah. So you've been there. Cockroaches, probably. Cockroaches, Ooh. Twinkies, and the Curlin Library. Oh, it still exists. <laughs> so our next question, what scene or character from this book, War and Millie McGonagall, gave you the most joy to write? What I loved the character? scene about um, um, <clears throat> Pete waking up early and coming and snuggling with Millie. And they went in the living room and they watched the stars kind of, um, go away. And she named them, and they talked about it all, and she gave them breakfast. I loved that. And my brother used to, or and his mother used to have had a son, Ed, who woke up very early, and it really was touching to me. So I enjoyed writing that scene. Hmm. And I loved Pete, everything I wrote about Pete. I thought it was great. The people want to know if you can tell us, <laughs> if you can tell us anything about your current project. Um, yeah, um, the tentative title is Sally O'Malley Discovers the Sea, and it's set in 1894 in Oregon. 1894, Oregon. And um, for some reason, she gets up, she runs away. Um, she was an orphan once again, and she was a hired girl in a hotel, and she was fired. And so she wants to go. She needed some place to go. She needed some place to go, and somebody in a store was talking about going west, young man, in the ocean, and she gets this uh, obsession with going to the ocean. So she's traveling. And I've just finished um, the section where she's on a riverboat on the Columbia River from Portland to Astoria, which is okay. it's not on the ocean, but it's very close to the ocean. Astoria. Now, that is very much the time period and location of our only Mamelia. Yes, that's just it within is. a few very, years. Yes, that's like yes, very similar. Similar, and she goes. Mamelia goes to Astoria. But, yes. Yeah, but uh, Sally doesn't stay there very long. It's just a way station, and she moves on down the coast. I love well, the exciting. Oregon coast, and I wanted that's to exciting. write it into a book. So well, that's interesting because we have a question about that's very similar to that. Let me see if I can find it. Okay. It says, I find it, uh, this is from Karen. I find it interesting that you said you decided on the beach setting before the character plot. Are there other books that you have written where the setting was chosen first? No. <laughs> there, there wasn't one. Um, a lot of them begin with the character Will Sparrow was uh, began with the character I wanted to write about uh, Elizabethan England and have somebody on the road, but I knew it couldn't be a girl because it was would be way too unsafe for her. So mm. that one was a boy. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Lucy Whipple. Um, I wanted to, to write a book about the um, gold rush. So that idea was there, but not the actual setting till I um, got involved with the book. Uh, the yeah, midwife started with the character, and of course, uh, uh, Bertie started with the character. Yeah. So, no, so that I, was the only one with the setting. You're just leading me into all of these questions. You're the pro here, Ms. Cushman, <laughs> professional here. So, when you decide on a topic, and you do you have all the characters in mind, or just one character in mind, and how do they develop as you write? No, I don't have all the characters in mind. I knew when I started uh, Millie McGonagall that she. I wanted her to have a family, an intact family, and all have their their issues and their challenges with the coming war. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Lily was there pretty soon. I think Pete developed a little later when I needed her to have a more loving relationship with, his <laughs> with Lily. <laughs> yes. And then they do. Then they and Edna was right at first, as I said, because I needed that character but her character developed through the book that, that she um, got more well-rounded. Uh, let's see, uh, Rosie, I wanted not a foil, but you know, somebody to, um, Millie to bounce things off of. And, you know, she doesn't understand how, how uh, Rosie is not frightened by the war and not really worried and why she can lie around in a bathing suit and, and sun herself. And, but then she discovers that Rosie's afraid of the ocean and she's afraid of 
bumping into fish if she goes in the water so that it balances out. It's not that Rosie is perfect and sophisticated yeah. and, and everything uh, Millie would want to be, that um, she has her own issues and problems. Uh, Kathy wants to know, who are some mm -hmm. of your favorite writers? Well, um, well, that I knew somebody was going to ask that because I find that it's not writers so much as books. I mean, there are books that I love. And so I love the, a writer, but I don't search out everything that they wrote. Um, I think my favorite book in the whole world might be Sarah Plain and Tall. I think that book, the first page even, is perfect um, scene setting. It tells you all you need to know to go on in that book. Everything in these, what, 15 sentences, a couple of paragraphs, tells you a lot of backstory so that we don't have to go through this, you know, when their mother died and blah, blah, blah. It's all there. I love that. 58 I love, pages. She did that in 58 pages. Yeah, it's incredible. It's crazy. Um, I love um, uh, Charlotte's Web. I mean, who doesn't? And that is the greatest first line of anything. Better than it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, if you ask me. That's actually, Karen, Where's, that's the one that I use to teach. Yeah. Writing where's like where's Papa going, going with that axe? That axe. Said yeah. fur to her mom as they were setting the table for breakfast. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. absolutely. A great, great first line. I love Kirby Larson's Hattie Big Sky. I loved learning that there were women homesteaders. You know, this whole world I never thought about. Young women homesteaders, and that there were people who failed at it and mm -hmm. went on to build a life. I thought that was that I love was that wonderful. Book. Yeah. Something about those West Coast historical fiction writers. Yeah. There's Karen <laughs> Cushman, there's Kirby Larson, now Jennifer Holmes on the West right. Coast. Right. You girls, let me tell you, giving us these great stories. Um, Arlette wants to know, do, do you keep a diary as a kid? And if you did, did um, have you referred to it like later on? I got a diary one year for Christmas and I wrote some things in it, but sporadically and then one day I went in the garage we spent a lot of time in the garage and uh, my brother was reading it out loud to a bunch of the neighbor boys so that was the end of my diary keeping <laughs> no more no more and I, yeah. I was never a journaler I, I know people um, who have had their had journals since they were you know children and they still have them and uh, a couple of my friends are like that um, Wendy and, and um, Myrna yeah, and kept them all and referred to them and they find them very rich and helpful but I never did that. So when you sit down to write are you almost always writing with like a project whether it's an article or a book like are you, do you always have like a mission? Yep yes I don't just sit and free write for myself I don't do that it's, there's always a product of some sort. And I or like I forgot Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. or maybe you wanted to tell your husband a story, but he wouldn't let you tell it, so you have to write <laughs> it. it. Have write it yes, I'm... Yeah. Now, have you ever told him that if he wants to tell you a story, he needs to write it down? No, that's that's very very interesting because I let him tell me stories all the time. You might have another Newbery medalist in the house. You never know, <laughs> right? right? It just starts with having to write down, having to write down a story. Uh, so I have one last question. Karen, mm -hmm. and then we will uh, bring Kellyanne back in to, to wrap things up. And I hope okay. that everyone gets a chance to get a copy of this book and, and read it and enjoy it. As, and I hope they enjoy it as much as I did. Um, what is your hope for this book? Well, I hope this book um, reaches a lot of readers, but reaches those readers who need it. I think young people find the books often, find in a book, what they need to find out. Um, and it's a scary time now. And there are a lot of things to be worried about, uh, not just COVID, but a lot of politics and violence in the world and you know, saber rattling. And um, so I hope that they find uh, ways uh, to, to, that they find some place for solace and peace and support the way Millie did and to see that mm -hmm. there is light at the end of all of this darkness and this gloom and this worry. Yes, that's mm -hmm. what I would hope. I'm thankful that they'll have the opportunity to, 
experience this book. So thank you, Karen, so much well, for your- Thank you, Colby. Your that was great. Amazing chatting with you. Kelly. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> that was a wonderful closing question. Thank you so much, Karen, for writing these kinds of books for young kids. I think it's really important for them to kind of have that escape, especially when they're like living through something big and historical like mm -hmm. we are now. So that's great. I um, have a question. Will all of these yeah. comments be available afterwards or they yes. disappear? They will. They will all be here on this page. So you'll get okay. to read them and Good. converse with your family about them afterwards. Good. Thank you everyone Why for you all of your that? lovely comments. <laughs> yeah, we've had a wonderful chat section tonight. Wonderful audience. Um, thank you guys for coming and attending our virtual event. Thank you for all your thoughtful questions. I think that was great. Um, one final reminder for our evening, if you click that green button below our video, it says buy books with signed personalized book plates. You can buy Warren M Millie McGonagall from Mysterious Galaxy and request that Karen personalize your book plate in your order comments. So do that, celebrate um, this book's birthday. It came out today. So best way to show Thank book love, you. buy it on its release day. First edition. And it's so pretty. <laughs> yeah. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and end our broadcast for tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thank you Kelly. And again, Karen and Colby. Thanks, Have a good Colby. night, everyone. Bye.